Do you remember what it feels like to be alive? The signs of spring begin a process within me as if I'm made of earth and bulbs are pushing through my tissue and sending shoots through my veins, trying to get to the surface and make flowers. The lyrics to the song the choir sang was inspired by our farming neighbors in Japan, whose presence was the most sure sign of spring. Farmers in the valley below us appeared when it still looked like winter, and they put on their hip boots and slogged through the lotus fields. They did it in their hip boots, but their ancestors did it with bare feet. And their toes would search for those lotus roots that had stayed under that cold, cold mud and grown sweet during the winter. By late February, Narcissus bloomed on the rocky seashore to the south of us covering the hills with pale yellow blossoms. But the true sign of spring everyone waited for were the buds on the bare branches of the cherry trees. These buds would grow and darken, and one day a couple of them would burst into bloom and a little at a time, and then in a huge celebration of flowers, cherry trees were blooming everywhere. The Japanese loved the cherry tree, and they brought them to Washington, D.C., and shared them with us, because it symbolizes their aesthetic. Their aesthetic comes from many sources, but one of these is Buddhism and the sense that, they, that, reality, that the reality of life is transience, that there is transience in all things. There is an edge of sadness that the blossoms will surely fall. And sometimes, often where we lived, they were blasted off by storms Right as they hit their peak, it would rain and they would all be gone. The state of the blossoms in Japan, these wonderful cherry blossoms, were gauged in percentages, which is also very Japanese. The national and local news was full of reports that 20%, that the blossoms were 20% in bloom at first on the southern islands. And then finally they were 90% in the cherry groves near us. And on a walk in Sugar House Park yesterday, we saw daffodils ready to bloom. And I found violets in the wells by our basement window. I'm not sure if that's dangerous or not. <laughs> the first time I visited Jerusalem, I was a child, and it was springtime. The rocky hills were spotted with poppies, bright red poppies, and rosemary bushes. All over the world, where Christians are gathering today, they are celebrating that day that Rabbi Jesus came into one of the gates of Jerusalem in triumph. Well, sort of triumph. This story of Palm Sunday is a strange one. Like the blooming of the cherry trees, it is full of the transience of life. It is impossible for us to look at Jesus' entry into Jerusalem without the shadow of his cruel death only a few days later. As he was entering the city, as many of you may remember, 
He sent two disciples ahead to a village to get a donkey and her colt. We are told that this donkey is necessary, that going through the city gates on a donkey is a fulfillment of prophecy. But wouldn't it have been more dignified to walk? For millennia, people have reenacted this day. Churches, in churches, we become a part of the crowd that welcomed the king who is arriving on a lowly animal. I reenacted this as a child when I attended an Anglican church. We had our other service on another day. And I remember waving the palm frond, which later became mysteriously a bookmark. I can't remember <laughs> how that happened. <laughs> but this passage of Jesus entering is full of foreboding and irony. We who are acting it out know what the people who originally held those palm fronds did not know, that Jesus, this man we are waving to like a movie star or a politician, he is going to be killed. And these people who love him so much and we are among them in this reenactment, they become the crowd that only a week later call for his death. By attending church on Palm Sunday, it's almost as, almost as if we are tricked in taking part of this fickle crowd who does not try to save him later. <coughs> They don't even try to get a murderer to die in his stead. The part we play in this narrative is odd. And for a few minutes, I want us to take the part we never took as children in this story. Let us think about that man from Nazareth. He has been preaching good things, love, forgiveness, all those things that are so hard to do. He's preaching giving up earthly possessions to the poor, giving up position on this earth for a kinder way of life. He has been preaching justice. I think we Unitarian Universalists would have liked his message a lot. And this message of poverty, this glorification of giving up earthly goods, is symbolized by this choice to ride a donkey. A donkey, not a camel. Have you ever seen someone ride a donkey? <laughs> it's very odd looking. They bump up and down, and their legs flap like this when they go fast. And the donkey looks strangely overburdened by a human. And donkeys make that funny sound that makes us laugh. Donkeys are animals for jokes. When I thought of Jesus riding this donkey, I remembered when I was at seminary for my last intensive class, and it happened to be around my birthday, which I didn't think anyone knew about. So I didn't suspect anything when everyone invited me to go to the Texas Roadhouse for dinner. I didn't expect anything until all the servers began gathering at our table and they had one of those saddles with them. And they said, is Patty here? <laughs> and they asked, um, they, and to be a good sport, um, I sat on the saddle <laughs> while the servers and my seminary friends sang happy birthday to me. And of course, everyone in the restaurant and bar stared at me. I really hate this kind of situation. <laughs> And I know that if anyone had taken a picture, my smile would have looked more like a frozen kind of... <laughs> um, but this ritual is really supposed to make people with birthdays happy. Um, but I felt this kind of mocking and shaming side to it. It was really hard for me to sit happily on that, sal on that saddle. And I wonder how Jesus felt on that donkey as it bumped its way through the city gate on an uneven stone path. 
I think that he must have known that what the crowd wanted from him was not what he was there to give them. And just like the crowds that surround politicians, one day they are throwing flowers and waving palm fronds, and the other day they are throwing rocks. I wonder about Gabby Giffords walking into that crowd outside of Safeway on the day that a man was preparing to kill her. Crowds hold celebration and danger. Life holds danger. There were so many reasons why Rabbi Jesus could have decided not to go through that gate. Those people seem a bit excited up ahead, and I'm going to feel silly on that donkey, and I have a feeling those people might want to kill me later. <laughs> I don't know if I can really trust this group of strangers up ahead. Yet, he moved ahead. There were people who wanted to celebrate him, and knowing that they would not always want to celebrate him, did not keep him away. He accepted the imperfect love that they had to offer. He didn't worry that the donkey made him look a little foolish with his legs hanging close to the ground. When Eleanor Roosevelt bids us do something that we are afraid of each day, I think that among those things we are afraid of are these moments when people show us their love. Are we afraid of deepening our attachments? After all, we are human. Our lives are quite short. In Japan, when people came to our house and met our cat, they often spoke of a beloved cat or dog from the past. And then they would say that death was so hard for them, the death of that beloved pet, that they could never look for another one. Their love and happiness of animals had become inextricably linked to grief. It is frightening to love with the knowledge of impending loss. Yet, as with the cherry trees, is there a way for that knowledge of loss to break through our fears and help us occupy that infinitesimal moment that is now? What gives you fear when you look ahead? Could stealing yourself, numbing ourselves against what we fear, keep us from being alive in this moment? Could that fear keep us from opening our hearts and minds to all the possibilities of being alive? There were many reasons for Rabbi Jesus to go the back way into Jerusalem or to escape to Egypt, <coughs> but he doesn't. He goes under the waving palms and walks over the branches spread before him. And in receiving from this fickle crowd, a teacher showed his generous heart and that he was not afraid to be alive. And I wonder if that morning stayed with him, stayed in his memory, and gave him joy when he took the next walk he took towards death. A few years ago, I met a physician who was also a poet, and he led poetry retreats for people who were terminally ill. The poetry showed that people who lived with their death were more present to life. Part of the Buddha's road to enlightenment was meditation on death. By acknowledging the whole cycle of birth to life, 
he could at last reside in the present, the only place where happiness can be found. Perhaps these hard bits that we try so hard to avoid are exactly what we need to deepen our happiness. As we commit ourselves, and you can see what you wrote on March 3rd about taking better care of this earth, as we commit ourselves to take better care of this earth as a community and as individuals, why don't we all dive in and live more deeply? It was the depth of, pre of his presence to nature that, speared, that spurred John Muir to fight for the legacy we enjoy of national parks. When two mountain climbers, one from Europe and one from the United States, was, were talking, they, he said, why in Europe do you have all of these hotels and funiculars on all of uh, these beautiful sites where there are mountains and incredible beauty. And the, and the other mountain climber said, we had John Muir. One man was able to start through his love, his ecstatic love of nature, to keep this legacy that we enjoy of national parks. Do you remember what it feels like to be alive? As Annie Dillard wrote, knowing you are alive is feeling the planet buck under you, rear, kick, and try to throw you. You hang on to that ring. It is riding the planet like a log downstream, whooping. On this day, as the Christian world awaits the tragedy of Good Friday and the mystery of Easter, <coughs> let us make a practice of being present to the life that is in front of us. When people wish to show us their love and praise, let us walk under their waving palms and over the branches they lay in our path. Let us brave the indignity of love and admiration and the certainty of death. In our bravery, may we be more alive. May the signs of spring accompany our awakening. May it be so.